Don't just go to the beach this summer. That's basic. Go to the beach and see former President Trump, Governor DeSantis, Kaylee McEnany, Senator Ted Cruz, and more at Turning Point USA Student Action Summit July 22nd through 24th in Tampa, Florida. Get details on ticket pricing at tpusa.com slash SAS. That's S-A-S. And use code ALEX. It wasn't until this year that I learned there are teenagers so addicted to gaming that they don't even stop playing when they have to go to the bathroom. They just urinate in empty Gatorade bottles and line them up under the TV. The Department of Defense has had to create an entirely new protocol to track child deaths due to parents being distracted by technology. Infants who sit in front of iPad screens from birth are unable to use building blocks because of their screen addictions. When I got my first phone ever, it was a pink razor in eighth grade, it never occurred to me how fast our technology would progress. Now, anytime I'm out to dinner, there is a child, and I'm talking under five even, with their face glued to a screen to keep them distracted. And I'm not a mom yet, but I cannot help but think, how are we allowing kids to be so good at using phones so young, so used to having screens in front of them, and are adults actually making a generation of kids into addicts? I went out to dinner just the other night with my boyfriend in Newport Beach, that's where he lives, and I could barely hear him talk because the family sitting next to us was letting their baby watch a show on an iPad the entire dinner with the volume up full blast. I was obviously personally irritated, but also I was concerned. Like, does no one wonder what that does to an infant's brain? So, of course, I got to researching, as I do all my parenting questions, and found an amazing book about this, and I had to get the author on immediately. He is a psychologist, writer, former clinical professor at Stony Brook Medicine, and a world-renowned speaker. He specializes in addiction and is one of the top addiction experts in America, specifically when it comes to young people's addiction to tech and screens. And I am so excited to say that he is here today to dive into the digital addiction plaguing America's children, what makes tech so addicting, society's lack of purpose, and how it influences young people, how it influences brain development, and what all this ultimately means for the future. Please welcome the author of Glow Kids, Dr. Nicholas Cardaris, to The Spillover. You know, Dr. K, when... I would hear people talk about addiction when it comes to screen time or video games and children. I always thought people were using it loosely, like an exaggeration. Oh, my son is addicted to video games. And then I read the stories in your book about some of the clients that you've had before, like the teenagers who wear diapers uh, when they're gaming, the the ones that have brains that are basically so warped from games, they don't even know what is the real world and what is gaming. So I wanted you, if you don't mind, to just share some of these anecdotes with us to really illustrate what true addiction looks like in a child or teenager, because some of this stuff was so wild to me, I was like, this can't even be real right yeah some of it was pretty shocking and so it's like anything else with addiction there there's a continuum right so there's an extreme end with anything so people can say that i'm addicted to strawberry ice cream or whatever the you know passion may be and people might use that expression sort of metaphorically but real clinical addiction the main uh, symptomatic or the main clinical criteria for clinical addiction is it really adversely impacts your daily functioning so that means like people's addiction, whether it's a substance addiction or a screen addiction or, you know, screen addictions fall under the umbrella of what are called process addictions. And that tends to be behavioral addictions like gambling or sex or technology um, is the um, habituation or is the uh, infatuation with that behavior really affecting your quality of life, your social relationships, your school, your work relationships, your mental and physical health. And so in the extreme end of that, yeah, I mean, I have a treatment program in Austin where we've really treated some people who have had everything from video game psychosis to um, severe episodes of just um, what we might call failure to launch, but depression and self-harm. Um, and and I think I wrote, well, the opening in Glow Kids that I talked about, I talked about a young man 
who really was my first eye opener to this whole issue of video game addiction, and that there's much more to tech addiction as well, um, was a young man who had blurred the lines between reality and his gaming. And uh, he had come into my office, as I described in my book, Glow Kids, and he was blinking hard. And he didn't know where the game ended and where reality began. And he had been playing World of Warcraft for eight to 10 hours a night for several weeks in a row. And essentially, he was in the Matrix and didn't know where he was. And he was psychiatrically hospitalized because it looked like, for lack of a better way of saying it, video game psychosis. And this was a young man that didn't have a history of mental illness or didn't have any other psychiatric red flags. It's, it seemed to be genuinely a case of gaming-induced um, reality blurring. And, and that, was, that was 10 or 12 years ago when I first dealt with that young man. And since then, I've dealt with a whole host of young people who have had extreme types of behavior. Um, the other one that I, wanna, that I like to give as an example, it's in the foreword of the uh, paperback edition of Glow Kids, is I was asked uh, right before the pandemic, I was asked by the Pentagon, by the Department of Defense to do a training for the therapist. The, the, the military has a mental health staff that gives mental health services for the Air Force, the Army, the various branches of the, of the armed forces. And they asked me to do a training for their mental health staff about uh, gaming addiction. And I said, you know, what's, what's the Army and Air Force want me to do a training for? And the woman who runs their mental health program said quite, what's the word? She was quite embarrassed almost. She said, well, gaming has gotten so so significant in barracks throughout the country, throughout the world, because essentially these are 18, 19-year-old teenagers who have come up through gaming culture. Uh, they've been gaming so excessively because they can't drink or drug because they get drug tested on right. base. So if they're bored or if they have some level of PTSD, they're escaping in gaming. And it's gotten so bad that in the year prior to them asking me to do this training, they had five babies, five Air Force infants who had died in the crib from parental neglect because their fathers had been gaming for multiple days in a row and oh they neglected to feed or attend to their baby. The problem was, and that really knocked my socks off, and, and I asked her, this happened in the last year in the Air Force. And she said, yes, we're trying to keep it quiet because, you know, she was embarrassed. Most of our people tend to have really low uh, rates of child maltreatment. But with gaming in particular, um, the problem was so significant that the Department of Defense had to create a new designation for the death certificate called death, to electron death by electronic distraction. And, um, and so when I give... When I speak at conferences or I talk to people and they're not convinced that this is a real addiction, my retort is, if, you're, if your baby is dying in the crib because you're so obsessed and habituated to your gaming platform that you don't attend to your baby and your baby dies, that the walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, that's a pretty severe form of an addiction. Yeah. Um, and speaking of that, OK, so the boy that you're that you described who couldn't tell he was in a video game psychosis, couldn't tell what was real, what was fake. His mom was a single mother, right, who had asked for mm -hmm. your help because she noticed something was wrong with her son. OK, this story floored me because the mother asks for your help. You mm -hmm. say he needs psychiatric help. They, they put him in a facility or whatever, right? He gets right. out and then she gets mad at you, correct, for saying to the son, you need to throw all your games away because you're addicted to them and you need to, you know, go outside, play sports, hang out with friends. And the mother got mad at you because, number one, she was a single mom who was like, you don't understand how expensive these games are. I had to work extra hours or whatever to afford these games. And then said, and also, it is dangerous for my son right. to be outside. Why are you suggesting for him to be outside? And so she didn't even want to throw the games away, even after he was clearly addicted and experiencing signs of psychosis. That's that's exactly right. That's a good detailed reading of that anecdote. which Because that was my other big takeaway. Not only did this kid have... Uh, have a matrix-like experience with gaming, but the parent, and by the way, the young man himself advocated, he said, help me to break free from this. I want to get rid of the games. Yeah. How do I do it? So so I was, you know, encouraging him. And I, you know, we don't always want pats in the back, but I thought that the mother would be grateful. And when I got, as as you mentioned, an angry mother, twofold, right? The games are expensive and now you want them to go out into this dangerous neighborhood. And, you know, truth be told, they weren't, 
they were in a moderately dangerous neighborhood. I would consider it, it was it was a suburban neighborhood that had some level of, you know, I, I don't want to even call it gang activity. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, but she was she felt her son was safer indoors, regardless of what he was engaging in and what was happening to him indoors. So it was surprising. It was surprising to share that reaction. Is that a pattern that you see with a lot of parents with kids who are really addicted to screen time is that they just feel like, well, this has to be safer. Yeah, they're on their video game or they're on their tablet for hours and hours a night or on social media, but at least they're not outside. I, I know what they're doing. They're safe in their room. And so parents are just rationalizing that the screen is kind of a babysitter and ultimately they're safer. That's exactly right. You hit Alex, you hit the nail right on the head. That's exactly right. And when I do, uh, I do a, a, a formal presentation at mental health conferences. And I go through the history of how we got here, how we got to the, let's call it to the screen kid and how we went from being, you know, outdoor children to indoor kids. And a turning point was 1979. And in 1979, there was one of the most high profile child abductions in the United States. Aton Pates in New York City was, he was certainly not the first kid to be abducted. If you really study child abductions going back over a couple of hundred years, there were horrific cases of child abductions. And in fact, according to FBI statistics, this is the safest era for children to be living in, in terms of child abductions. Uh, but what happened in 1979 and 1980 was it was the advent of CNN. CNN and Ted Turner were uh, un unveiled in 1980. And so now, now you have the 24 seven news medium. And so you had a high profile child abduction and the new news formats, which, you know, before people forget, you know, and I'm a, I'm of a certain generation where I remember the before times before cable, yeah. um, you, you had, you know, you had the three half hour evening news shows. So you got all your news in 30 minutes. You had, you know, Walter Cronkite or Tom Brokaw, and that was it. Once CNN came around and then all the other 24 seven news cables, they had to fill content. And there's an old saying in journalism, if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these news shows started really scaring the hell out of parents. So now all of a sudden it was an abducted child anywhere in the country was going to be part of a multiple day news cycle. And Aton Pates was that first young man that got so much uh, national notoriety for being abducted that parents became increasingly frightened. And so over the course from 1980 to 2000, 2010, you started seeing parents who started having shorter and shorter leashes on their kids. Uh, we were no longer sun up to sun down children like I was raised were just be home for dinner. And, and that's increasingly gone away because exactly like you said, parents felt like, well, if my kid's in their bedroom, they're safe. And now we know that they're not safe because they're, essentially the computer is a portal and it's a portal to some very, uh, not just gaming and social media platforms, but chat rooms and predatory sites and all sorts of other um, unsavory ways of discovery. Yeah. And the, and the little boy you're talking about the case, that was the first kid to ever go on a milk carton, I believe. Yeah, that's right. That's mm -hmm. excellent. Very good. That's right. He was, um, that's right. And they never found his body and there's one person in jail now for his um, murder, but it was, it was sociologists have pointed to, to that as sort of a cultural moment well, we shifted as a society to being much more fearful. And it was the intersection of that abduction and 24 seven news cycles. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So how are we seeing brain development affected in particular in millennials and Gen Z compared to generations like Gen X, who during the uh, start of the 80s, they would have been like the latchkey kids coming home from school. Their parents were both working. Their parents were divorced. So they kind of took care of themselves. But then it was late 80s, more early 90s. We start seeing all of these parents, like you said, becoming more helicopter, helicopter parents um, and then giving your kids screens, letting them grow up with screens. So how are kids' brains developing developing differently now? Yeah, so so we can begin to look at it, I think, in two buckets, in two different um, ways we can sort through it. So there's clinical impacts, right, that are, by clinical Im impacts, I mean depression and ADHD and anxiety. I mean, those are clinical effects that are happening. I'll explain how the modern screen immersion leads to those, you know, an increase in things like depression. And then there are neurophysiological impacts, how it actually changes the wiring and the physical structure of the brain. Now, some of this was the most fascinating. And recently, um, you know, re when I say recently, over the last eight to nine years, we have now 
black and white fMRI brain imaging studies that show that screen time impacts the brain in exactly the same way as chronic substance addiction. And, and primarily that's one of two ways. Um, screen time, there, there's a part of the brain that, and, they, and it was Dr. Bart Sokas was a neurologist at UCLA that did uh, fMRI studies on the brain on chronic substance addicts for decades, decades ago. And we have a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex right behind our forehead, which is our executive functioning. That's our decision-making. That's our um, consequential thinking. That's, that controls our impulsivity. And what they found with chronic substance addiction was that that part of the brain begins to shrink over time. It actually physiologically atrophies. And it's called the DGM. The dense gray matter of the prefrontal cortex gets smaller so a person who has a compromised prefrontal cortex is much more impulsive, much poorer decision-making, um, and, and they, they, that correlates to a whole host of problems, which is why addicts have a hard time moderating or, or not being addicts because it's a double whammy. The further down a substance addiction you go, the more compromised your brain becomes to make good decisions. Mm. So it's kind of a catch-22. Similarly, now we've had at least a dozen studies that showed these same effects with excessive screen time. The, and people had a hard time understanding this, that something that you weren't ingesting, because people could, I guess, understand if you were ingesting a substance, it, change, it can change your physiology. But now we understood that watching something was changing our neurophysiology. And that DGM, the dense gray matter of the prefrontal cortex, shrank as a result of excessive screen time. So now you had kids that were much more compromised in their executive functioning impulsivity, language, decision-making. And, and sure enough, there was a study from JAMA, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association uh, Pediatrics, the pediatric uh, magazine, that, uh, peer-reviewed magazine that came out two years ago that looked at the screen impacts of children between the ages of two and five, cognitive delays, cognitive impacts for kids who had more than an hour of screen time without parental supervision. It was creating developmental issues. And so there's a whole host of studies that show that um, you're going to be primed that essentially what we've done for this generation of screen kids, if you were raised, if you were basically one of those kids that had a tablet dropped into the crib or one, two, three years old, you were given a smartphone or any kind of device, we were developmentally stunting that child, Ooh. right? So we were priming them for impulsivity. We were affecting their cognition. And one of the things that gets really underappreciated is, is not just the ADHD impulse piece, but the ability for kids to be creative. Yes. Um, if you're a parent, the best thing that you can do for your child developmentally is to allow them to be bored. A bored child has to then develop what's called an active imagination. And creating that imagery creates neurosynaptic muscles of uh, of creativity. When a kid creatively plays and plays make-believe, that's really healthy for a child. But children don't play make-believe anymore because their imagery is now already pre-baked for them and, and sort of drilled into their heads. And so that part of their brain that creates and imagines at atrophies. So when I work with teenagers or young adults or Gen Zers who were, and I could tell right away when they were given, you know, if they were a high screen kid, if they were given the tablet at age two or three, they have absolutely no creativity. They can't draw you a picture or tell you a story or write a poem. There's sort of this shoulder shrugging, apathetic, overly stimulated, yet underly uh, curious uh, population cohort. And, and it's really sad to see because we're not doing our kids a service. And, and part of it, and I'm going to say this and shut up, it's we as the adults in the room drank the Kool-Aid mm -hmm. that somehow we're, you know, we're in a high tech society and our kids will be behind if we don't drop a tablet in the crib or give them a tablet by their kindergarten or first grade, they're going to be behind. And so we want to keep up with the Joneses. And yet what we've done is we've stunted our children because Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the Google boys, Montessori students, uh, Jeff Bezos, the Amazon King, a Montessori student, all these brilliant minds and technology didn't have tech when they were kids up until the age of 13 or 14. 
I've shared quite a bit about my volunteer work as a court-appointed special advocate with kids in foster care. And part of what I do is spending quality time with the kids on my case and getting to know them. So I know how to advocate for what they want in court and also personalize them to the judge. And I have two sisters right now. The oldest just turned 11. And I'm always looking for creative and special activities to do with them. And she happens to love art. And she's very good at drawing in particular. I heard about Classy Artist Box, and so I had to sign her up right away. She gets this whole box, an art class basically, in a box with four projects and lessons each month tailored to her age or skill level. And each Classy Artist Box project has a corresponding video tutorial. You will learn concepts and techniques that will help you learn to create art like you've always wanted. Even if you're already an artist, you can use the monthly reference photos and supplies to help keep you motivated. If you're an adult who loves art, or you just really want to keep your kids occupied this summer, the Classy Artist Box subscriptions start at preschool age. It's like homeschool art class. I love it. You can get a 30% discount off the first order of one of their monthly subscriptions. Go to ClassyArtistBox.com and use code ALEX. And I want to get into that because there was some stuff you said in your book that I was like, oh my gosh, that is a bomb drop. Okay, Is there a direct link between the ADHD epidemic that we're seeing in kids who grew up with screens and autism in kids that grew up with screens? Yeah, unquestionably, uh, unquestionably. So um, the ADHD is direct. And anybody who wants to look that up, it's Dr. Christakis. Dimitri Christakis is the head of the University of Washington Pediatrics Unit. He's the main guy that's done all the ADHD and screen time research. And the screen time research in ADHD is undisputable. It started way back in 1990 with television screen time. We knew through Dr. Bart, uh, Christakis's research that for, okay, so the key ADHD window is the ages of two and six. That's when the child develops their ability to attend, to pay attention. And if during that key developmental window, a kid in 1990 or you know 2022, for every hour in front of a television set, increase the rates of ADHD by 10%. So if you had a three-year-old in front of a TV for three hours, they had a 30% higher rate of ADHD. Now they did that research again in 2010 and later on with interactive screens like tablets and Chromebooks and iPads. And the effect was exponentially higher. How much higher? Something like to the magnitude of two or three times higher. Oh my gosh. And because... And here's the here's what here's the problem. My generation, I'm I'm of a certain age. We, when we were raising our kids, I think the mistake that we made was that we conflated a we. Yeah, we conflated modern screens with television. Most mm-hmm. of us grew up on TV. We felt that they were fairly, you know, and there, and there was there was some panic around television back in the 70s and 80s and violence on TV. But for the most part, it was viewed as fairly innocuous. And and but modern screens are different than old screens. This isn't just a smaller TV. It's a more interactive and immersive digital platform. So when we were watching TV as kids growing up and there was a TV in the living room and we were 10 feet away from it, we were a passive viewer of a digital experience. Now our children are interactive participants and they're immersed in this digital landscape. And so it has a much more powerful, stimulating and high arousal effect than watching TV uh, used to. So the ADHD effect is more pronounced. Essentially, what we're doing is we're habituating our kids to being overly stimulated. Because if you watch any kind of, you know, if you watch an infant or a kid who gets hypnotized by, you know, the smartphone or anything that they're watching, they get habituated to having to be, to have all the bells and whistles to keep them entranced. Now you take away the device and their attention wanders because now we've habituated them to needing the bells and whistles to be able to focus. So that's what we're doing. We're not engaging them in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. We're, we're habituating them to need high stimulation to be able to focus. What about and that's autism? that's why we're seeing. So it's interesting. You know, one of my colleagues, Dr. Dunkley, who is also a screen, she's an adolescent psychiatrist in Los Angeles. She wrote the book, How to Reset Your Child's Brain and How to Do a Digital Detox. She's found that she's seen over a thousand kids over the last 10 years, and she's found that over 70% of them, um, she won't diagnose or medicate any 
child or teenager until they've done a four or six week digital detox until they unplug. And she's found that up to 70% of their presenting symptoms go away just by, just by unplugging. So that's mood disorders, personality disorders. And she says, and yes, even spectrum and autism disorders that she's found that even in autism, you, if you catch, if you unplug them early enough, you see that effect uh, or the, the present, the presentation of autism dissipate. Now, I do think there's real organic autism, but I think we're either exacerbating it or causing it in certain instances by overly stimulating at age inappropriate stages of development for some infants. Yeah. But Dr. K, parents are told by their schools that, you know, traditional book learning doesn't work anymore. We need to use more technology in the classroom. Are parents being lied to? I think the school administrators are being uh, lied to. And then I think we're drinking that Kool-Aid. Um, I speak at a lot of education conferences, a lot of national education conferences. Um, and, and my question to administrators is, show me the one study, show me one singular study that screens in the classroom or some kind of screen learning and uh, is, is beneficial. And there's not one study that shows a tablet for a first grader or a third grader leads to better uh, pedagogical outcomes in eighth grade or high school. Not, there's not one study. And when you ask the superintendent to justify the investment in technology, they stutter and they stammer and they say something like, well, Apple says it's great for the kids. Well, of so, course, Apple says it's great right. for the kids. I wrote, I wrote an op-ed for Time Magazine uh, in 2016 um, called, I think it was called the, uh, the Digital Hoaxer. But basically, uh, education tech, ed tech, at that point, at that time, pre-COVID, was a $60 billion a year industry. And there is a big financial agenda to get our kids. And, you know, and, that, and essentially our schools have become our digital drug dealers. They, they're the gateway drug for a lot of our kids. A lot of parents are trying to be tech cautious and then they get undermined by um, perhaps well-intentioned but misinformed school districts that think, well, if uh, District A is giving a, a Chromebook to an eighth grader, well, we'll give it in sixth grade and fifth grade and fourth grade. And, and there's, this, there's this race to give kids screen time earlier and younger and earlier and younger when the research clearly shows age and appropriate technology is harmful. Mm. And all we have to do is look at Finland. Finland has the best educational outcomes. Every year, they're in the top one, two, or three of the best performing countries. And their minister of education said, no individualized devices for our kids. They do have at the high school level, they have smart boards, they have some technology in the classroom, but they don't have the 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 rocket in the pocket they don't have the distracting you know phone or ipad because it's a distraction and it so it doesn't lead to better educational outcomes and it increases the possibility of clinical disorders like depression and anxiety we can get into that whole part of why does a kid in front of a screen get more depressed than um than other kids what what is it about screen time that creates depression we can get into that as well yeah yeah go for it well so before COVID, we had in 2019, we had the worst psychiatric metrics for young people that we've ever had in recorded history. We had the worst rates of anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicidality, overdose, um, ADHD. Everything was spiking. And the interesting part of it was, Alex, that this was at a period of time that we were increasing the pharmaceutical solution. So we had increased antidepressant medication by 300% over the last 20 years. So we were throwing a lot of meds at the problem and yet depression kept spiking. And and so the narrative that myself and some other colleagues believe is the one of the, well, the two main causes of of depression that's not, uh, if it's not organic is lifestyle based. So being sedentary, is is a driver of depression. So we know that screen time makes people a lot more sedentary. Like just sitting around. I hate to say it, obese kids who play esports and don't go outside and play anymore are going to be much more sedentary. So they're sitting around kid is going to be much more likely because they're not raising their serotonin levels and not oxygenating their brain. So they're more likely to be depressed. Plus the other main driver of health is is connection, genuine connection, face-to-face friendships and connection. And so... And, and there was a guy called Dr. Erlardi who did all this global depression research. And, and he had found that the healthiest cultures were indigenous 
uh, the Kaluli in Papua New Guinea, and tribes in South America and Africa. Really? And he studied depression for 20 years. And it was these primitive cultures who were pre-industrial, had really hard lives. These were not cultures that like had an easy life. They struggled for day-to-day -day survival, but they had zero, I mean, not low rates of depression. They had zero rates of depression. And, and Dr. Lardy was really fascinated by this. And he found that the four immunizing factors were, they were much more physically active. They were much more uh, cohesive as a community. So much more close connections and relationships. Uh, they were outdoors and in nature more and they had higher omega-3 diets. If you look at what the digital age has done to us as a culture, adults and kids, but especially kids, sedentary and cohesive, so now we're, we're this sedentary, screen-based, non-face-to-face interacting species, and that's not the way that we were evolutionarily hardwired. Yeah. We're, we're social species, and technology gave us the false promise of connectivity, but what it did was it isolated us more because it doesn't give us connectivity in the face-to-face -face format that we needed. And that's why, and then COVID was just a, a nuclear bomb and all of that with quarantines and increased screen time. And, and we saw that COVID was a perfect beta test to show, okay, let's see what happens to society when we double the screen time. And what we saw during COVID screen time doubled and depression tripled. Yep. So what is the educational industrial complex and what do screens have to do with that in our kids? Yeah. Well, the, as I said before, there's a financial agenda. There are certain folks that are called entrepreneurs, people that are trying to capitalize on what they see as the new, really robust and potentially uh, gold-laden market. And Rupert Murdoch was one of those folks. Rupert Murdoch is, has never been confused with someone who is concerned about the education of young people, but he saw an opportunity. So people like Rupert Murdoch created a company, a, a billion-dollar investment called Amplify that tried to get uh, every kid in America, a tablet, you know, a, a chicken in every pot and a tablet in, in every classroom. And, um, it, you know, so they were called education disruptors. And, and really the research shows that there's no better, all the education research shows that the best educational experience is the Socratic circle. An educated uh, person at the front of the class that engages in the question and answering back and forth circle dynamic rather than uh, screen-based learning where you're answering a bunch of questions and then going on to the next module, which is not the most effective way to learn. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a book by two teachers that came out recently called um, Screen Schooled. And, and I've been on a couple of panels with them, great guys. And they talked about the Googlefication of the classroom. And the Googlefication of the classroom is a dynamic where it kind of works in the elementary levels. Google is great to look up stuff, right? It's a great search engine to find out facts, but facts isn't education nor wisdom. And when you just are Google dependent, you don't get what they call the rich tapestry, the context of the facts. So a teacher helps connect the dots for you. So, you know, the war of 1812 is a fact, but what caused it? What were the historical antecedents? What were some of the, the, the what was the flavor of the war of 1812 isn't as readily spewed out by Google. And so what they found was that as kids aged up and they got into middle school and high school, they became less able to process and infer information and less able to critically think because yeah. they were able to recall data, but not an analysis of that data. If you're caught up on my Daily Show politics, then you'll remember a week or so ago, I talked about this Instagram and TikTok account that I love called Our Friendly Farmhouse. She posts videos of her kids catching lightning bugs and running around with chickens to this tranquil music. And there is just something so beautiful about that life. I don't know if I'll ever get to live on a small farm like that personally. I mean, my boyfriend, Nick, definitely is not about the country life, but I can support American farmers with my Moink box 
subscription. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door, whether you live in the country or the city. I love Moink, and you will too. 60% of U.S. pork production comes from China. Stop supporting China and start supporting American farmers. I am so impressed with their bacon and ribeyes. 10 out of 10. Keep America farming by signing up at moinkbox.com slash spillover. Next week is the last chance for conservatives to get a full year of free filet mignon. So sign up now. Moinkbox.com slash spillover. That's M-O-I-N-K box.com slash spillover. Wow. Okay. And you talked about, too, in the book that there was a Project Veritas video that really mm-hmm. exposed the educational industrial complex. What was that video? Because my, because cute conservatives, who I call people that listen to the spillover, cute conservatives love Project Veritas. So they'll be interested in this. Yeah. So when it happened before um, Common Core, um, standardized textbooks had to be done state by state. And this is part of the gold rush of uh, entrepreneurs. It was very tedious for the three major textbook companies to create a textbook for each of the 48 to 50 states at that point, uh, because every state had different standards. Um, And so then Common Core created a national standard for almost all 50 states, except for two or three. And so now this is viewed as as a wonderful opportunity to create one sort of digital platform that could have been uh, really ideal for um, for recurring revenue, for sales to school districts. It was, it was a money opportunity. And, and Project Veritas spoke to um, high-level people in the, <laughs> in the uh, publishing, uh, in, in the book publishing world. And essentially, when they were asked about what's best for kids, kind of laughed at that idea and said, this is all about money. You know, lipstick on a pig. You know, we're just going to kind of keep cranking out uh, the next iteration of, of product and it's all about the product and selling the product it has nothing to do there this is the the executive speaking yeah they could care less about kids educational outcomes they cared about sales and selling the product which you know should it i guess we've all suspected that in Mm -hmm. a similar way that we all kind of thought that big tech had an agenda but then you know a documentary like the social dilemma pulls back the curtain and shows us here's some defectors from big tech telling us that We've been addicted, not by accident, but by design. And that there's really smart people that are creating algorithms to habituate us to their platforms. And, you know, I I just finished writing. I've been working for the last year and a half on on the follow-up to Glow Kids. There's a book called Digital Madness that's coming out in September. But now, yeah, yeah, so because when I wrote Glow Kids, the, the heavy lifting back then was to even create awareness or an understanding or convince people that, yes, you can become addicted to your devices. Um, and, and now the, the larger narrative is, what has it done to our species, this love affair that we have with technology? And so why are we seeing this polarization in our politics? Why are we seeing a real sp- <coughs> spike in not just, <coughs> excuse me, not just things like depression, but uh, in my treatment program in Austin, we're seeing a big spike in personality disorders. Um, borderline personality yes. disorder, narcissistic Dr. K. personality disorder. Could yeah. what what could you say to the spike in personality disorders? It almost seems trendy on TikTok. Every single time I scroll on TikTok, somebody else is saying, "Oh, I have multiple personalities." They're talking yeah, about their yeah. alters and That's all right. this. It's like, okay, That's this right. seems like an explosion of personality disorders all of a sudden. That's what the new book is about. Uh, essentially, now social media has become a digital social contagion. So COVID was a viral contagion. It's spread by viral means. Now we have psychiatric digital contagions. Um, and so because we're a social species and because we, we get influenced and shaped by our social world, now most of us, or especially the younger folks, inhabit a digital social environment. And, and what you mentioned is exactly so TikTok Tourette's. I don't know if you've, have you, yep. you see about TikTok Tourette's. So we're seeing these really popular social media platforms spreading psychiatric disorders. So TikTok Tourette's dissociative disorder, you know, multiple personality, what we used to call so DID. So what you're seeing is you have a handful of really uh, successful influencers who are now uh, being watched 
uh, the, the Tourette's three influencers had over 5 billion views. And all of a sudden, in the last year and a half, you had fe- adolescent females, hundreds of which were coming down with Tourette's disorder. And their pediatricians were scratching their heads because, first of all, Tourette's disorder tends to be predominantly male, not female. Mm-hmm. And, and second of all, um, it usually happens in early childhood. And it ha- tends to be the, the dominant form of tic tends to be facial tics, not gesticulating arm gestures. And so what they found was that these hundreds of young women that were coming down with Tourette's disorders in adolescence, they were all following these Tourette's influencers. Oh, who, my gosh. And, and then the one was British, and so she had a British accent. So some of her followers started cursing and having Tourette's tics, verbal tics with a British accent. Get out of here. So, so, so uh, yes. So, and, and by the way, I studied the influencers, the Tourette's influencers videos. They didn't even have Tourette's syndrome. This was performative. Oh this my was, gosh. This, because let's face it, who gets the coin of the realm on social media is what? Followers. And what gets the most followers, the most over-the-top behavior. Yes. So now we have a, a performance Olympics of the most outrageous behavior. So now whether it's psychiatric disorders like, so now you have dissociative people as, a, as an example. Real, authentic, multiple personality disorder, now called dissociative disorder, used to be on average three or four alter identities, you know, Sybil and three faces of Eve, kids who had been sexually abused in childhood who couldn't handle that reality would develop an alter identity to process reality. Mm-hmm. They didn't have dozens and over a hundred alters. So now you're having these popular DID and they're called systems with over a hundred identities and they're the whole LG, LGBTQI spectrum. So you'll have a host body. They're called hosts now. A host system will have uh, a 40 year old black lesbian female, a 20 year old white male, a 35 year old uh, bisexual uh, Asian. Um, and so they embody, and, and to me, so their followers now are beginning to also demonstrate signs of dissociative disorder. But, doctor, the people that are saying they have all these alters that are, you know, I've got a black female and LGBTQ and whatever, those people that are experiencing those alters, are they themselves actually white? Typically, um, typically, see, typically. that's what's interesting to me. And and yeah. I have talked about this a lot. One of my favorite guests that we've had on this spillover was Abigail Schreier, who I'm sure you're familiar mm-hmm. with. And she talks yeah. about the social contagion in regards to young females and the transgender movement. And I'm like, OK, yeah. All these kids are being told you want to be anything besides white, straight and white. That's the worst thing that you could be. And so I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're getting on TikTok. They're seeing these people with lots of followers that have things like Tourette's or whatever. Or they're like, oh, I could have multiple personalities. And even though I'm white, what if all of my other personalities are people of color or some sort of minority group? Then, therefore, I can somehow be marginalized and be cool. That's right. So now we've made in our in our effort to support marginalized identities, we've not just been supportive, but we've idealized these identities. And I think now we've made them. I think you're you hit the nail exactly on the head. And that's what I say in one of my chapters. I do mention the trans movement as well. The prevalence of the trans of young people who identify as trans has spiked so significantly it defies the normal way of things. And mm-hmm. and I'm convinced it's because exactly the dynamic that you've said is, is going on. So being trans and, and really sort of, um, you know, kids, let's face it, we all go through some general adolescent confusion. Most of us go through some level of kind of feeling out who we are in our identities when we're in high school. That tends to be the age of exploration with your sexuality and with everything else. But now, as you've said, there's this um, amplification of voices, and they're like you said, the the coin of the realm is performative. It's 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 who gets the most, makes the most noise, and so uh, a, a lot of um, really popular trans uh, social influencers who get hundreds of millions of views, uh, dissociative uh, influencers who get hundreds of millions of views, you can't help but not be shaped by some of those. So if you're and it may be conscious and it may be subconscious. So the, the young person may not be saying, oh, okay, I'm going to be like X on the screen, but they're being shaped on a, on a subtle and subconscious level as well as oftentimes maybe a conscious level. So we've made it 
cool. We've made it the norm. We've normalized it in the way that it's the ideal, in the way that we've also, I hate to say it, but we've marginalized who used to be, what used to be the mainstream. Yeah. And, and so we've demonized that so much to the point that this, I think a lot of self-hate going on and sort of looking for alternate ways of being. The, the other thing that I think social media has done is um, we all understand now there is no more nuance and conversation between people with different opinions or different sides of the aisle, both politically and socially. I was a university professor for 10 years, and and it used to be a wonderful thing to debate somebody who had a different perspective than you did, right? That's how we learned and we grew. We debated each other. We had conversations. Well, what I think has happened, and I write about this in the new book, Digital Madness, is if you if you understand how media shapes our brains and the structure of our brains to process information, well, think about what algorithm-fueled social media is. Um, it's polarity-driven mm-hmm. because we know that engagement is fueled by emotional reactivity. Yes. So, um, you know, if you lean left, you're going to get an amplification or an extremification of left content. And if you lean right, you're going to get the same thing on the right side. You're not going to get moderate content. You're not going to get a thoughtful, critical analysis. You're going to get the loudest extreme voices on either side of the equation. What I'm hypothesizing that's done is that it's shaped the brains of young people who are developing into binary polarity buckets, that they could only see things in black and white, that they can only see things, uh, they don't see the gray. And if you look at the main symptom of borderline personality disorder is black and white thinking. Um, uh, Holy you, cow. You, you, so it's called dichotomous thinking. You can't do nuanced thinking. So this huge spike that we have in my clinics where everyone's got borderline personality disorder now. So what I'm writing in my book is I think because real borderline personality disorder is a very dangerous, very hard to treat, and they have very high suicide rates. Um, there, it is a real thing, but we're seeing numbers now. Um, but I don't think it's the real article, just like I don't think it's real transgenderism and just like I don't think it's real dissociative disorder. I think so. I'm calling it pseudo BPD, which is social media shape, because what we've seen is when we unplug these people from social media for six weeks, their borderline symptoms go away, where a real borderline person doesn't get cured after six weeks of being unplugged. Amazing. So we're, so we're seeing pseudo dissociative disorder, pseudo transgenderism, pseudo BPD that are social media shape. But the problem is it's such a third rail. Uh, I, I, you know, I know that I'm going to be called transphobic for even speculating that just like Dr. Littman at Brown, who did the study about rapid onset gender dysphoria, got called, um, you know, transphobic because she pointed out the fact that, hey, these these adolescent females who all of a sudden this huge number, which defied prior statistical analysis, are now identifying as uh, biologically born females are now identifying as males. Uh, and this this transition tends to come after an increase in their social media consumption. Is there something going on with the social media consumption and how Mm -hmm. it's impacting or shaping the development and the identity formation of these young people? And I have to say, absolutely. So now we've come five years ago, I'm writing a book about video games can be addicting and, and, and all that stuff. Now, how is it shaping the fabric of our identity, of our society, of our young people? And how is it driving our mental health epidemic? Because a lot of those young people now, we were, were a huge spike in suicidality, overdose, because if you're not, first of all, if you're not comfortable in your own skin and you're confused about your identity, you're much more likely to hurt yourself. But second of all, we're, we're, we're creating such a fragility culture. We're not teaching character development, critical thinking, those life skills, which I talk about in, uh, in my latest book, I talk about the antidote to the modern is the ancient. And I'm a big, um, I've studied ancient philosophy and Socrates played on the classics that, that being able to critically think is an antidote to some of this new fluid subjectivity that, that can be so overwhelming to people. But we're, what, what's happening is we're creating such a fragility of young people. So I've been helicopter parented by parents who haven't allowed me to scrape my knee or, or you know, uh, get a speed bump and have to get up and, and work through things. I haven't developed a sense of resilience. Now I've been bombarded by uh, shaping messaging from social media. 
now I graduate from university or from college and I've got to go into the workplace and now I can't handle life on life's terms. So I'm going to be more depressed, reactive, uh, suicidal. I've seen more 20 year olds in an existential crisis or midlife crisis than I'd ever seen in the 30 years that I've been working as a psychologist. Uh, we have young people who are just so empty and fragile and despondent. And, uh, and I, and it, it it's obvious to me what's going into that uh, equation. And, and, and many people are afraid to speak about it because it's not politically uh, or professionally um, beneficial to call certain things what they may be looking like. Well, Dr. K, we are so just freaking proud to know you and know that there are people like you out there who are willing to do some critical thinking and, you know, go into these kind of controversial subject matters and call things out that a lot of other doctors now are, are being scared to talk about. Um, I know that some parents are going to be thinking, OK, doctor, I hear your concerns. You know, uh, I limit my kids screen time to one hour a day. It's just one hour. I can't take away all their screen time and then be the only kid at school who's not on screens. You know, my kids are I, I really watch them. They're not going to become addicted. Is that good enough? Well, it's, it's all relative. I don't think there's a magic number. I always this is the number one question I get asked is how much screen time should I limit my kid to? And it's not an hour or two hours or three hours or 30 minutes. It really depends because all kids are different. So some kids are going to be much more impacted and much more dysregulated or much more um, adversely impacted in less time than others. So what you really should be looking for as a parent is what seems to be the sweet spot for your child. You know, if, if your child seems to get really reactive, really dysregulated after 30 minutes of screen time, maybe 30 minutes is the limit. If it's an hour, if it's an hour and a half, what we should be doing is having conversations with our children, explaining the digital landscape. We should be showing our kids the documentary, The Social Dilemma. What I find really young people react to is they don't like being manipulated. Like So they don't like parents telling them what to do, mm -hmm. but they certainly don't like big tech manipulating them. And so when a 14-year-old or a 16-year-old watches The Social Dilemma and they get told, so what you thought was free choice, you're just you're just being used. You're just being manipulated. You're just a, a, a consumer to them. In fact, you're, they're just data mining your information. That's when I've seen young people that I've worked with being like, what? Yeah. I don't want to be just that. I want to own my own autonomy back. And, and so uh, I have 15-year-old identical twin boys, by the way. So I'm in the fight as well as a parent. And I've tried to be as tech cautious, but we live in the world. So we're not going to be Amish. I mean, we could be, right? But we're not going to be Amish. <laughs> um, so so I have as many conversations with them as I can. You know, they just got phones. They're, they're ninth graders in school. I got them a Gab phone, which isn't Wi-Fi compatible. It's So they can text. It looks like a smartphone. They can text. They can um, listen to music. But it, they're not going to be gaming on it. And they're not going to be going down other digital portals that my wife and I, frankly, aren't comfortable with. Yeah. And they understand why, you know, both I we keep both of my boys busy in sports, music and academics and we travel a lot, you know. And so if we can keep our kids filled with with good things, hopefully, um, then they're less thirsty for some of the bad things. Um, so. What are some of the telltale signs that a child is struggling with tech addiction and it's like danger zone? A parent needs to get involved right away. And then um, what are those crucial steps if a parent suspects that they have a glow kid, as you would say? Yeah, I mean, so in that continuum, so you might have kids that you're seeing are, are so the first things to look at is are the academics beginning to suffer sleep deprivation? Are they staying up late? So do they seem sleep dysregulated? Are their academics suffering? Are there shifts or changes in their personality or their moods? Which, by the way, this reflects substance addiction as well. Um, these are similar. Um, so that's typically what we begin to look for. Um, one of the other main telltale signs is they stop engaging in the other things they used to be engaged in. So if, if that child used to play a musical instrument or be involved in a club or a team or some other activity, and all of a sudden they quit all those things, and now they're just involved more. Um, you know, changes in, I, I will say changes in personality and identity. Um, I think right now kids 
Um, I'm very adamantly against, um, again, age and appropriate exposure to kids to topics that, that they're too impressionable for everything mm-hmm. from, like we've said, transgender uh, ideas. And I'm from New York City. I was raised as a uh, in a very open part of New York City where it was really progressive and, and quite honestly see the downsides of age and appropriate exposure to children. Um, we You cannot tell a six-year-old he can he or she can choose a gender. Yeah. These concepts are beyond their understanding. Uh, we, we never used to do anything like that. And that doesn't make anybody transphobic or anything else. It just makes people understand child development. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I think so, so being careful and, and, and moderating things like that, if the extreme ends of this spectrum uh, is when you start having violent or really dysregulated episodes with screen time or you know, I've worked with a lot of families where they were afraid of the children. The children started getting really physically aggressive. Um, that tends to be the tipping point for treatment for a lot of folks is, is now I can't physically remove my child from their screen time or from their gaming platform. They've assaulted me. They've punched holes in the wall. Um, they've 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 stolen my credit card. Oh, my um, gosh. Yeah, yeah they, I've seen a lot of a, a lot of physical aggression uh, that can happen. And so that's you know, if it's gone that far your child needs treatment at that point. It's just sort of beyond the, let's have a conversation once a month. Now we have to get some level of professional treatment. And, and there's limited options. Not a lot of therapists know how to work with this issue, but there are treatment programs, very few, but that also treat this issue when it's crossed over into a more significant uh, level. And, and that was the number one thing. When I wrote Glow Kids, I had literally thousands of emails from families that said, we went to our local therapist, we tried to get some help for our child, and we were either gaslighted, they said that we were the problem, or they didn't understand this issue. And thank you for giving us a voice to understand that, you know, there are, there are some kids, not, I won't say all or most, but a good percentage of kids were getting, were getting really affected, and, and nobody was listening to the parents who yeah. were saying, this isn't my child anymore. The book is called Glow Kids by Dr. Nicholas Carderas, and the new book comes out in September. Remind us what that one's called again. Digital Madness, and it's the same publisher, St. Martin's Press, and it's coming out September 13th, available on Amazon for advance order now. But it's it really looks at everything we just talked about with the new landscape of TikTok and social media really driving some of, uh, some of well, the subtitle is how social media is driving our mental health crisis. Fascinating. I cannot wait. I will be pre-ordering that. Thank you so much, Dr. K, for coming on The Spillover. Thank you for having me on as a guest. Thank you. Keep on doing the great work that you're doing. As soon as this interview was over, I went and pre-ordered Dr. Cardaris's new book that comes out in September. It's Digital Madness, How Social Media is Driving Our Mental Health Crisis and How to Restore Our Sanity. Any episode where I feel like I got a little brain workout is an episode that really makes the favorite list for me. All that talk, you know, that we did about the educational industrial complex, how screens are literally stunting child's brain development and contributing to ADHD problems was excellent. If you have a child that's a glow kid, it is not too late to change course. And if you aren't a parent yet like me, I hope this episode was just as valuable and fascinating for you. There is a lot of heart and soul that goes into each episode of The Spillover and Finding Guests. The one thing every week I need from you is to please leave a five-star review. Tell your friends to subscribe to this show. Next week is an absolutely wild, wild episode and interview. And as soon as I recorded it, I said, oh, this is my new favorite episode. The Spillover is back next Thursday. Thursday at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Subscribe to Poplitics on YouTube so that you can watch the interviews too. I'm Alex Clark, and this is The Spillover. Love you, mean it. Bye. Bye.